in the last episode. Reincarnation, the belief that the soul, upon the death of the body, comes back in another body, or form. An idea of rebirth, that is often looked forward to, by many, from the lands between. This is the story, of Gaius, the Tarnished. His body full of wounds from the grafted sign's sword, thrown into a cliff with his heart barely beating. But somehow, Gaius's will to live. Allowed him to survive. Greetings. I am Melina. I offer you an accord. Blending in with the shadows entering stealth mode. Someone must extinguish thy flame. Let it be Margit the Fell. His burned skin starts to slowly heal, what previously was a sight that one can't withstand, became as bright as the clouds in the sky, but with his eyes, void, and empty. A new form for our protagonist one might say, but is it actually new? Or maybe, Gaius just retrieved, what was taken from him. Following the light from the sight of grace, didn't only guide our protagonist to a proper path towards his future, but it also hints memories of his past. Intrigued, Gaius follows the light from the sight of grace, pointing to the road that leads to Stormvay Castle. But the sorcerer lends our protagonist a piece of advice. Even with his body restored, Rogier tells Gaius that in his current state, he's not ready for the challenges that lie ahead. As much as the sorcerer wants to help, Rogier must travel his own path guided by grace. Before they part ways, Rogier says something about a catacombs near Groveside Cave, taking the sorcerer's advice, not as a fellow tarnished, but as a friend. Gaius goes to the opposite direction of the light from the sight of grace. Seeing how Gaius massacred his friends using guard counter, this little imp really adapted quick and didn't attack Gaius. At least he can brag about not getting guard counted when he finds his friends. In hell that is.
is a lot of imps. Now aware of the imps that are on the wall, Gaius rushes in for round two, striking him first not giving him the chance to surround him. Somewhere, a heavy door has opened. Locating the entrance that awaits the yellow mist, a sign that a strong opponent is on the other side, waiting for him. The one who rules this catacombs and commands the imps. was somewhat effective, but the watchdog swings are heavy that Gaius can't just rely on it. Getting behind it is also not an option, leaving our protagonist no choice, but to face it head on. The watchdog perishes, souls that are trapped inside the catacombs, freed at last. But five of them remained, approaching Gaius. The wandering nobles pledged their loyalty as the gratitude. With their path of grace, pointing to different paths, Rogier knew that Gaius will need a companion. What a friend indeed. Wherever Rogier is, on this day, if Grace ever decided to cross their paths once more, Gaius promised to thank him personally.
Gaius continues to traverse the path opposite to the light of grace, finding himself in an entrance of a cave. Infested with demi-humans, Gaius cleared them with ease. Another tarnished stops our protagonist from going further, but with the wandering nobles by his side, Gaius ignores the knight. Worried about his fellow tarnished, the knight enters with Gaius knowing our protagonist will need the extra sword. Filled with vengeance after his partner died, the remaining demi-human chief's breathing pattern became very readable. An opening exposed, Gaius follows the scent using the tip of his sword. The knight's skill, Gravitas, opening the demi-human chiefs, giving Gaius more room and options to attack. Though Gaius believed he could have cleared that without his help, having the knight around made it easier. Do you have someone that you wish to protect? Isvan asks. Still having no memories of his past, only one person comes to mind. But knowing Rogier's abilities, Gaius doubts that Rogier needs his protection. If they're important to you, then you have to get a better shield. An advice Istvan left to Gaius before they part ways. Back to following the opposite path of the Light of Grace, Gaius found a dozing soldier in Limgrave. Approaching the soldier, our protagonist asks if he can borrow something. I wonder what that is. Arriving on his next destination, Gaius noticed something different. His role sucks. His new great shield, compared to his medium shield, is much heavier. Because of the knight's words, Gaius keeps the great shield, swapping out his broadsword to a dagger. But wanting to be someone who can protect anyone, Gaius also kept his old shield on his right hand.
great shield is heavier because it is sturdier, making the enemy stumble as their attacks were blocked, giving Gaius the perfect time to use the impact that he absorbed, bashing his opponents with his right shield as they gasp for air, resulting to a stagger. Summoning the Wandering Bates, Gaius, dual wielding his shields, prepares for battle. Gaius's new shield didn't stand a chance against the troll's devastating swings, the nobles laid waste. The troll's hardened skin making Gaius's dagger useless. With no flasks left, Gaius lost the feeling from both of his arms. Until that one time, by sheer will to protect himself, his arms move on their own. The scent is definitely stronger after Gaius staggered the troll, but he has to overcome the troll's innate hardness to achieve it. Placing the great shield to his dominant arm this time, Gaius sacrifices defense for more damage in round two.
with Gaius having two more flasks to spare. It was the end of the line for the Stomdigger troll. Or that's what our protagonist thought. exits the tunnel triumphantly, venturing further away from the path that the light of grace is showing him. Guy's sieges are fought with the boys. responsible for the desolation of this fort awaits him. Coating his blade with his own blood, truly a terrifying ability to get hit by. That is, if he can hit guys with it. This guy really didn't care that his friends are getting massacred by Gaius. He must be cooking something really good over there. Hello? Is somebody there? Might I bend your ear for a moment, please? My name is Arena. I've escaped from Castle Morn to the south. The servants there have rebelled. I... I can't be sure what it is. My eyesight's been weak since birth, you see. But I swear I heard frightful howling from all over. My good father secreted me out the castle, but decided himself to stay. He says it's his duty. As commander, Irina continues to share her stories about her father, making our protagonist wonder if he has one. Gaius, lacking the ability to speak, just listened. Amazed on how someone that's been denied with the sense of sight see love through his father's actions, another name has been added to the list of people that Gaius wants to protect. I... I fear for father's life. The servants are full of wrath. Filled with hatred for every one of us. They've since come for every one of the companions I escaped with. They haven't spared a soul. I fear it's no different at Castle Morn. Please, I implore you. Would you mind taking a letter to my father? At the castle. My soul wishes that he escape. 
even if his honor should be the price. Please. I just want him to be safe. Thank you. Dearly. Then please, take this. Deliver it to my father, who remains in the castle, if you please. Having no use for it, Irina offered a shield given by her father for Gaius to take. Gaius accepted not only the shield, but a promise, like how this shield protected Irina. Gaius will bring her father back safely. Upon seeing how the misbegotten rebels laid waste, on Irina's what once called home, rage fills Gaius, leading the wandering nobles to attack every rebel on sight. His anger subsides, and now that Gaius has thought about it, perhaps storming through the front gate, when they're clearly outnumbered, was not the play. Gaius sneaks past the rebels, going for a more peaceful approach, Our protagonist searches for Irina's father. A group of rebels distracted as they fight a lone soldier. Gaius makes the run for it. Arriving at the top, our protagonist found what he's been looking for. Ah, there's a face I've not seen before. I'm Edgar, warden of this castle, as ordained by Lord Godric himself. But you can see how things have turned out. The menials have all rebelled. They gave me good service, or so I thought. But it seems it was all an act. 
Foul creatures, as it said. And true enough, they're foul inside and out. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but whatever you come here to do, I'm afraid Castle Morn won't hold much longer. Take this, by way of apology. I see. From Arena. Thank you. I mean, you're dead. But I can't leave yet. Even if the castle should fall, as commander, I must remain to ensure the treasured Sword of Morn does not fall into the wrong hands. If you see Arena, do tell her that her father will come for her once he's fulfilled his duty. Bound by his sole duty to protect the sword, Irina's father, Edgar, didn't want Gaius to be further involved. But on Gaius's right hand, he saw the shield that he gave to Irina. Knowing very well how desperate his daughter on seeing him alive, Edgar shares the burden of his duty to Gaius, allowing our protagonist to tag along, to protect him at all costs. Arriving at the southwestern shores of Castle Morn, there awaits the leader of the rebels, the one keeping Edgar from being free from his duty. So this is what it feels, to be outnumbered and get piled on. The briars from Irina's shield cuts the beast, with the wound getting deeper with every strike from Gaius. Jumping in the air out of desperation, Gaius unleashes a powerful counter. Debt for keeping the sword from those fallen creatures. I'm no longer bound by duty. Once I've rescued Arena, I will spend my remaining days with her. Thanks to you, I will be reunited with Arena and devote my remaining days to her. Arena has a gentle nature, though. I only hope it remains intact. Edgar is finally unbound from his duty. On their way back to Irina, a troll blocks their way. Not risking anything that may ruin their reunion, Gaius signaled Edgar to go on as he deals with the troll. Despite having shields on both arms, Gaius failed to protect someone important to him. 